Good afternoon. So far in this course, we have reached messenger RNA, and now we're going to do something with it. Today, we're going to translate that mRNA into proteins, protein synthesis. Now, this isn't just a lecture on protein synthesis. As I've told you before, viruses are parasites of the host translational apparatus. Yet, it wouldn't be very interesting to tell you how cells translate mRNAs unless viruses did something different. And of course you do. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. How viruses translate a bit different and how they modify the translational apparatus for their own means. So here we are in the Baltimore scheme. We have traced all seven genome types to mRNA, that green molecule in the middle. And today we are going to take that mRNA and see how the cellular translational apparatus uses it as a template for protein synthesis. So first let's review the basic translational apparatus of the cell to make sure we are all on the same page. Here on the upper right is a typical messenger RNA. Cellular mRNAs look very much like this, and so do many viral mRNAs, but not all of them. A typical cellular slash viral mRNA has a five prime cap structure, which we've talked about before. It's put on during transcription of the mRNA, and there's a structure of the cap. It is basically a G linked in a 5 to 5 prime linkage to the first base of the RNA. And this cap is found on most eukaryotic messenger RNAs, with the exception of certain organelle and viral mRNAs. Some viral mRNAs do not have caps. And as we said, it's a 5 prime 7 methyl guanosine joined to the second nucleotide of the RNA by a 5 prime to 5 prime phosphodiester linkage. And this cap is important for many aspects of mRNA biogenesis and function, including transport, turnover, and translation, as we will talk about today. mRNAs are also composed of 5 and 3 prime untranslated regions or non-coding regions, a 3 prime poly A tail, and an open reading frame, which typically encodes a protein. The 5 prime untranslated region is typically 50 to 70 nucleotides long, although it can be much longer. It often contains secondary structure, and this is an impediment to ribosomal transit. It must be unwound to allow the ribosome to move from the 5' prime end to the initiation codon. So the length of the UTR and its secondary structure most certainly influence translation efficiency. Then we have our open reading frame, which typically begins with an AUG, but not always, as we'll see and then a stop codon, followed by a 3' prime untranslated region, which can also regulate the efficiency of translation initiation and mRNA stability, and a poly A tail, which is also necessary for efficient translation. Translational machinery consists of ribosomes. These are large protein RNA assemblies, of course. The eukaryotic ribosome is shown here are flying turkeys. They consist of 40S and 60S subunits. Each is made up of uh, ribosomal RNA, one or more, and quite a few proteins, as you can see. And the uh, RNA is an important part of the ribosome. Here on the right, it's shown in pink. The protein is in blue. And, many, and there is good evidence which indicates that if you take away the protein, the RNA can still carry out the catalytic function of the ribosome, that is to make a a protein to catalyze peptide bonds. tRNAs are another important part of the translational machinery. These are the adapter molecules that read the code on the mRNA and put in the right amino acid. And here are three views of tRNA structure on the, on the left is the linear sequence of different bases forming this tRNA. You can see the anticodon is at the bottom with the red box around it. This is the part that reads the mRNA triplet. And the amino acid attachment site is at the other end at the 3' end. In the middle is a uh, alpha carbon trace of the tRNA. Again, the anticodon and the 
AA attachment site are highlighted, and finally a space filling model. So these are L-shaped molecules you can see. Other materials are needed to translate proteins. These include initiation, elongation, and termination proteins. We tend to divide the translation of an mRNA into three stages, initiation, elongation, termination, and there are proteins needed for each step. And in eukaryotes, these are called EIFs for eukaryotic initiation factors. Elongation proteins, eukaryotic or EFs, and termination proteins are ERFs. Now, in eukaryotic cells, we now recognize two distinct mechanisms of protein synthesis initiation. There's 5 prime dependent initiation, which is done on most mRNAs. And in this mechanism, the initiation complex binds to a 5 prime cap structure and then scans to find the initiation codon. And up until the 1980s, it was thought to be the way that mRNAs were translated. But viruses lead the way. Internal ribosome entry was discovered on viral mRNAs. This is when the initiation complex binds uh, near the initiation codon. It does not bind at the 5' prime end, as does uh, the ribosome in the other mechanism. And this says, again, was initially discovered in viral genomes, but now is, is known to occur in cells as well. So let's take a look at 5' prime dependent initiation. Here we have a 40S subunit. These are free in the cell. Uh, they associate with a variety of initiation factors that are important for these initial steps, including EIF1A and EIF3. And then a ternary complex comes and binds. The ternary complex consists of GTP, EIF2, and the MET tRNA. Ternary complex, as you will see, plays an important role in initiation and in the regulation of that process. It associates with the 40S subunit. It then binds EIF4G, which is this red molecule, which then binds the cap. Now, we don't know if this is exactly the sequence of events, but this is just one version that I'm presenting to you. Now, the key here is how this initiation complex, you can see this one is called the 43S pre-initiation complex. How does it recognize the mRNA? Well, it does so in this mechanism by virtue of the 5' prime cap structure this little blue box with a C in it. That's our signal for a cap structure. There is a protein in the cell, a eukaryotic initiation factor called EIF4E, and it binds very specifically to the 5' prime cap. EIF4E in turn binds to EIF4G. You can't see that interaction here. It's covered up by EIF2, but you'll see it later. EIF4G in turn binds EIF3, and then EIF3 binds the 40S subunit. So that brings in the 40S subunit along with all the other factors in the pre-initiation complex, the ternary complex, plex, et cetera. Okay, so that nucleates the initiation complex at the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA. So the cap is very important for this, and that's why this is called 5' prime end dependent initiation. <clears throat> EIF4G is a large protein, 220,000 Daltons molecular weight. It has, as shown at the top here, a variety of domains for interacting with other proteins, including poly-A binding protein, PABP, and we'll look at the function of that in a moment. EIF4E binding site is here, EIF3 binding site, uh, and some sites for others as well. This uh, 4G is cleaved by viral proteases from picornaviruses, and we'll talk about that later. But here is the cleavage site for the protease. Now, at the bottom is a re-examination uh, of the interaction of 4G with this initiation complex. And we've taken away a lot of the other factors so you can see it more clearly. And again, we have the mRNA with its 5' prime cap structure. It is interacting with EIF4E. <coughs> and in EIF4E, of course, binds to the cap. EIF4G binds to EIF4E and EIF4G binds to 3, which in turn binds to the 40S subunit. So you can see how the 40S is brought here by these series of protein-protein and protein-cap interactions. All right, so now we're going to move to the next step in translation to find the AUG codon. So here at the top we have our 48S initiation complex. It's all of these factors bound to the mRNA via the cap, and the, the 
point is to find the AUG where initiation is going to begin. And it's believed that this complex, the 40S subunit and associated factors, has to scan or move along the AUG uh, to, to uh, initiate translation, and that may be an energy-dependent process. And once the 48S complex finds the AUG, uh, then translation initiation can begin. A series of events then occur. Uh, EIF5 comes in and helps to hydrolyze the GTP in the ternary complex. A lot of initiation factors are released. And then the 60S subunit can join to produce uh, this complex, the mRNA, the ADS ribosome, and the MET tRNA initiation tRNA. Now, in order for the initiation complex to move to the AUG, it has to make sure that there is no secondary structure. So on the top here, we're showing one such secondary RNA structure, which could impede the transit of the initiation complex. The complex has built within it a, an RNA helicase, and that's this green protein here, EIF4A. Its function is to melt out any secondary RNA structures that are present in this region. <clears throat> now, this helicase is only good up to a certain point. If these structures are very, very stable, it can't melt them. And then translation is, is inhibited. But in general, the amount of secondary structure can serve as a regulator for how efficient the mRNA is translated, and that's because the secondary structure can regulate the transit of ribosomes to the initiation codon. <clears throat> now, we believe in general that the mRNA forms a circular loop uh, in order for efficient translation to occur. And the way that happens is shown here. The N-terminus of EIF4G, in addition to having a binding site for EIF4E, also has a binding site for the cellular protein PABP, poly A binding protein. And that, of course, as it, its name suggests, binds the poly A sequence on the mRNA. It also interacts with the N terminus of EIF4G. And this allows the RNA to form a closed loop. And biochemical and genetic evidence indicates that this closed loop is necessary for efficient translation of an mRNA. If you disrupt the loop genetically or biochemically, you get less efficient translation. And we're not sure why a, a closed loop is needed for efficient translation, but one idea is that as the ribosomes translate the open reading frame, they reach the stop code and they can simply keep moving on the mRNA and reinitiate. And this also is one reason why the poly A tail is important for efficient mRNA translation. So that is 5 prime N dependent initiation. But as I've told you, viruses do things differently. And that leads to the next discussion of other mechanisms for decoding that have been discovered in virus-infected cells. And one of them is called ribosome shunting. So again, these are mechanisms that were discovered by studying virus-infected cells, but which probably exist in uninfected cells. In this case, it hasn't been discovered yet, I'm quite sure. So ribosome shunting is a mechanism of translation whereby uh, ribosomes bind to the 5' end via the cap structure, as we've just described, they, and they scan a bit, that is, they move towards the AUG, but then at some point they leap over the secondary structures and, and reach the AUG without going through them. So this is a, an experimental uh, evidence for ribosome shunting. What's been done here is to make... Uh, three different messenger RNAs, uh, and each of them has a protein that's going to be translated, which can be assayed readily, and the protein is shown on the right in this western blot. It's called S-antigen. This is actually a hepatitis B viral protein. So if you take the wild-type mRNA at the top and translate it uh, in vitro, you get uh, two proteins main, as shown here. If you put a stable stem loop structure here, uh, just before the AUG codon, and translate that in vitro, it's called the three prime insertion, you see that it does not have any effect on the amount of protein that's made. And this is a very stable stem loop of negative 80 kilocalories per mole. It's a measure of the stability of the base pairing, which is known to block scanning of ribosomes. Even with the ribosome-associated helicase, it cannot get through this kind of secondary structure. Yet you see that the insertion of this has no effect. <clears throat> 
if you put the same stem loop structure, however, upstream of the secondary structure in this mRNA, then you can see its presence blocks translation. Now, this green RNA is a sequence from a viral mRNA, in particular an adenovirus mRNA, and it's known to have these secondary structures in it. And what this RNA does is confer uh, what's called ribosome shunting, so that if you put the secondary structure near the AUG, apparently the ribosomes can go right over it. And if you put the secondary structure upstream of this, uh, the existing viral mRNA secondary structures, it impedes translation. So how does this work? Well, what we think happens is that the ribosomes bind the 5' prime cap, and they begin to scan, and they have to probably reach the first secondary structures, and then they're, they're handed over the rest of the secondary structure to the AUG. And so that's why having this secondary structure, the red one, at the very beginning blocks translation, but at the end it does not. Let's take a look at that in another figure here. So here we have the mRNA 5' prime UTR with all the secondary structure. This is the wild-type sequence. The ribosomes have bound the cap, and they're scanning. They reach the first secondary structure, and from that point on, they can be passed over the structure to the AUG codon. So the ribosome is not scanning through and melting each of these. Rather, it's being passed over in some way to the AUG. And this is one depiction of how that might work. And this must be a very highly structured RNA and that, can, that the ribosome can just pass over to reach the AUG. And this ribosome shunting has been found in the mRNAs of a number of different viruses, as you can see here, and hasn't yet been discovered, to my knowledge, in cellular mRNAs. Could be wrong there, but I'm sure it will be. And this, so you would ask, why do we do shunting at all? It's predicted to decrease the dependence of any particular mRNA for the cap-binding protein complex, EIF4E and EIF4G, uh, during initiation. So this uh, mRNA doesn't have to be unwound because the ribosomes are passing over the secondary structure. So in cases where cap-binding proteins are limiting, which can happen at certain parts of the cell cycle, for example, or during virus infection, then this shunting would allow efficient translation in the absence of cap-binding protein. The other mechanism that was discovered in virus-infected cells is internal initiation, and this was first found in the 1980s in the genome of poliovirus. And when the genome of polio was sequenced, what was found was a very long 5' prime untranslated region, which is shown at the top here as single-stranded RNA sequence. You can see it's 742 bases long. Uh, and then here is the initiating AUG and the, the beginning of the viral polyprotein. If you remember, poliovirus has a plus-strand RNA genome, and it encodes a very long polyprotein that is translated and then processed by viral proteases to give rise to the final viral proteins. The initiation of that polyprotein translation begins right here at this AUG. Now, this was puzzling, this long 5' prime UTR, for two reasons. First of all, because it had a lot of AUG codons in it. And it, it wasn't understood how a ribosome could bind to the 5' prime end and scan through all of those and reach this first initiation codon without falling off. The other problem, of course, was that this, pro, this viral RNA didn't have a cap at its 5' prime end. Rather, it had a protein, and indeed this protein is, is removed when viral messenger RNAs are, are translated. The protein is put there as a primer during RNA synthesis, but then is believed to be removed from messenger RNA. So the viral RNAs that are translated don't have a cap. They have just a 5' prime phosphate uh, at the 5' prime end of the RNA. So at the time, the dogma was ribosomes bind cap at the 5' prime end. They scan to the first AUG. So this, this viral RNA violated that idea. So how, how did this work? So the idea arose that perhaps the ribosomes can bind internally. Maybe they don't scan. So an experiment was done to address that possibility. And in this experiment, two different mRNAs were constructed. They, all, they are both capped mRNAs with poly-A tails at the 3' prime end, and they encode two proteins. Here you can see the proteins are called TK and CAT. And these are simply two proteins that can be assayed using antibodies. Now, this is an old experiment uh, 
you can tell by the use of these reporter molecules because if this experiment were done today, you would use luciferases, which can be readily assayed without running a gel. When you translate this mRNA on the left, now I should tell you that the mRNA, in addition to the two reporter molecules, has a sequence in between the two. On the left, it's a random sequence, and on the right, it's the five prime untranslated region from poliovirus. Now, if you take the control sequence on the left and translate it in cells, you get a lot of the first protein, the TK protein. As ribosomes bind to the cap and they scan to the AUG, they translate, and then most of them fall off the mRNA at the termination codon. A small fraction continue to scan and reach the second open reading frame, so you get a little bit of cat protein made, but not very much. If you translate the construct on the right, now you find you get a good amount of both proteins made, both the upstream and the downstream protein. And the idea is that this sequence from the poliovirus genome, the I, which now is called the iris, allows for internal binding of ribosomes and translation of the second open reading frame. Now, in eukaryotic cells in general, when you have two open reading frames like this on a single mRNA, the second one is rarely translated very well. But this shows that this sequence from poliovirus allows internal initiation so that you can get efficient translation of a second open reading frame. So this was called an iris for internal ribal excuse me, this was called an iris for internal ribosome entry site. And it's since been used uh, for many experimental applications where you want to make two proteins from a single mRNA. Now, the skeptics at the time said, well, how do you know actually that the ribosomes are binding internally? It could simply be that this sequence allows ribosome transit more efficiently than your control sequence. So to address that, uh, the experiment on the bottom was done, which, in which the same two mRNAs were taken and translated in cells infected with poliovirus. Now, as you will see later, poliovirus inhibits cap-dependent translation. So this mRNA on the left, when put into a poliovirus-infected cell, results in no protein synthesis. This is because the ribosomes cannot bind the 5 prime N, so therefore they cannot translate either open reading frame. If you put the second mRNA into poliovirus-infected cells, you only find the production of the second open reading frame because the ribosomes are able to bind internally to the iris and translate the cat gene. And again, the TK gene is not translated because the ribosomes cannot bind the cap because of the polio-infected alteration, which we'll talk about a bit later. So this uh, established that this sequence from the polio genome could lead to internal ribosome entry. But as always, there were still skeptics, uh, and the next experiment to address them uh, dealt with the idea that an iris does not need a free 5' prime RNA end to attract ribosomes. You can see in this depiction, the ribosomes are binding internally, whereas 5' prime end dependent translation needs a 5' prime end, as the name suggests. So uh, the way to test that hypothesis was to make circular mRNAs. So two mRNAs were produced, one with an iris and one without. Both have an open reading frame whose translation would lead to a protein that could be detected. Now, if you have a circular RNA without an iris and you put this in a translation extract, you make no protein. Ribosomes cannot bind to this green sequence because there's no iris and there's no free 5' prime end with a cap so it doesn't get translated. If you put the circular RNA with the iris into a translation extract, you make protein, because again, the ribosomes can bind internally to the iris. There's no need for a free 5' prime end. These are what irises look like. In general, they're highly structured. Uh, these are four different kinds of iris. We, we call them various types now. And the types are based on various properties of the iris. In addition, they're, they're secondary structures. As you can see, there's a lot of RNA secondary structure in the form of stem loops. Uh, 
uh, which varies from iris to iris. On the upper left is the type 1 iris, which is the poliovirus and rhinovirus or enterovirus iris. Uh, and you can see it's highly structured. Uh, the AUG is right here at 743. And the way this works is that the ribosome binds uh, to this structured RNA and then scans to the AUG. Here's on the next one is the type 2 iris, which is found in other picornaviruses. You can see also extensively structured, but different. And here, this oval is what we call the EIF4G footprint. Remember, EIF4G is that large linker protein that helps nucleate the ribosomes onto the 5' prime end of mRNAs. And we believe that the 4G binds right to the iris, and that's how it recruits ribosomes. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. On the upper right is the iris of hepatitis C virus, uh, and at the bottom is the iris of a, an insect picornavirus, cricket paralysis virus. Now, you can't identify an iris by a sequence. There is no canonical iris sequence. It's the structure of these RNA elements that is important. And we cannot identify an iris by its structure by just scanning sequences. So you have to do an experiment. If you have a very long 5' prime non-coding region on your mRNA and you think it might be an iris, you have to make a bisistronic construct to prove that. And what I mean by that is you have to make an mRNA with two open reading frames, two reporter molecules, with your sequence in between them and see if you can get translation of the downstream um, open reading frame. The hepatitis C virus deserves special mention because it is an RNA element that can bind the 40S subunit in, without any other initiation proteins. And uh, the, the EIF4E is another of the initiation proteins that does bind the iris as well, and it's needed to have the 60S subunit come in. But 40S alone will bind uh, the iris of hepatitis C virus. So again, this, this really emphasizes that this iris is very good at attracting initiation complexes. How do these irises work? All right, let's compare them to cap-dependent initiation. Here on the top is the structure of the initiation complex that we discussed, an mRNA which is recruiting the 40S subunit via uh, the interactions with the cap structure. And all the eukaryotic initiation factors are needed to translate such mRNAs. We think that for the type 1 and type 2 irises, it is actually EIF4G that binds the iris directly, and I mentioned this briefly already. And of course, once you have 4G binding, you can get the 40S subunit in by those protein-protein interactions that we talked about before. So these kinds of viruses require all the eukaryotic initiation factors, but not EIF4E, which is the one that contains 4G and 4E. The, the significance of this broken end terminus will be apparent in a bit. And then we have the hep C iris, where the 40S subunit binds uh, directly to the RNA, and the only initiation proteins you need are EIF2 and uh, EIF3. We've since found irises in many viral genomes, and this is a selection of them here. You can see the picornas, the flaviviruses, pestiviruses, and retroviruses and insect picorna-like viruses have irises, as well as uh, cellular mRNAs. These have been found to contain irises as well. Now, these cellular mRNAs, like many of the viral mRNAs uh, that have irises, are capped. So it's not clear why these would have an iris in them and also have a cap. In other words, caps allow you to be translated in a cap-dependent manner or 5 prime end dependent manner, I should say. But the cellular iris bypasses the need for a cap, so it's not clear why cellular mRNAs need both. One idea is that uh, in under conditions where cellular translation is inhibited, like when uh, mitosis occurs, for example, cellular cap-dependent translation is inhibited, maybe for certain proteins to be made, they need to be synthesized by an iris-dependent mechanism. So that could explain why certain kinds of um, cellular protein-containing mRNAs need to have irises. All right, so these initiation steps have brought us uh, 
to this stage where we now have a complete ADS ribosome at the initiation codon. We now have a MET tRNA uh, positioned in the P site. And now the next step, of course, would be to put in the next amino acid in the A site uh, to start protein synthesis. Uh, viruses, again, do this differently. Some viruses, they can initiate translation without methionine. Of course, that's called methionine-independent initiation. And here in panel A is one example of this. This is the iris of the insect picornavirus, cricket paralysis virus. As the name implies, this is a virus that, that paralyzes crickets. And it's very related to polio, just like polio paralyzes humans. Uh, this virus paralyzes crickets. And it initiates translation without a methionine. And how it does so is shown here. The iris of the viral RNA, so the viral RNA is shown in green here, it folds to mimic an initiator methionine tRNA. You can see this RNA is folding back on itself. It's base pairing with itself as if it were a tRNA, and it's sitting in the P side of the ribosome. And the ribosome thinks it's a initiator methionine tRNA. So it says, we're ready to go. We're ready to make proteins. Uh, and the next thing that happens is the insertion of the right tRNA in the A site. And so the protein actually will begin with whatever that next amino acid is, and not a methionine. And it's really quite remarkable. Here's another example of that. This is a plant viral RNA. So this is a positive strand RNA virus of plants. Here's the 5' prime end. It's got a cap. 3' prime end forms a tRNA-like structure that sits into the P site and mimics the initiator tRNA. And this tRNA-like structure happens to have a valine attached to it. Um, and so that protein, the protein encoded by this viral RNA initiates with a valine and not a methionine. This is interesting because the way we figure out how many genes are in any organism once we get its sequence is by looking for open reading frames that begin with a methionine. So we may be underestimating the number of proteins encoded in any genome if we just do that because we're missing these methionine independent initiation events. Let's look a little bit more at the genome of this unusual cricket paralysis virus. It's shown here. This is a plus strand RNA virus, just like poliovirus. It has VPG at the 5' prime end. It's polyadenylated. One of the main differences is that the open reading frame is split into two open reading frames in cricket paralysis virus. As you recall, poliovirus and other picornas have a single open reading frame. This one for this insect virus is split. There are two irises in this genome. There's one at the 5' prime end, shown down here, to allow internal initiation in the absence of a cap. Remember, these don't have caps, these genomes. And then there's an iris in this intergenic region between the two open reading frames. And that iris is the one which, in which the RNA folds to mimic an initiator tRNA. Now, you need an iris here between the two open reading frames because, well, you actually... If you made a single polyprotein, you could process it to form all the proteins you needed. But apparently the virus has chosen to make two polyproteins. And to get this second one translated, you have to have an iris here because ribosomes do not efficiently reinitiate after termination of the first open reading frame. So this brings us to a thorny issue in translation of eukaryotic viruses. So this, this is illustrated on this slide. On the top is a typical eukaryotic mRNA that we've been talking about with a cap in five and three prime untranslated regions, a poly A tail, and a single open reading frame. And this is the way most eukaryotic messages are constructed. They are monosystronic. They can only encode one protein. And that's in contrast to bacterial and archaeal mRNAs, which are polycystronic. You can see here, these mRNAs have 
multiple open reading frames in them so that ribosomes can uh, initiate translation at the first AUG, then they terminate, and then ribosomes can initiate at the second and terminate, the third and terminate, and so forth. You can make multiple proteins. And this, the ability to do this is because there are Scheindel-Garno sequences around the AUG, which are complementary to ribosomal RNA sequences, and they allow the ribosomes to bind at H, each AUG. It's sort of like an iris, but very different mechanistically. Eukaryotic cells don't have that. Now, you may ask, why not? You just told us that there are iris sequences that allow internal initiation. So in theory, you should be able to construct this kind of an mRNA in a eukaryotic cell and by putting an iris in between each open reading frame. And we know these work because we construct them in the lab. People make disestronic mRNAs all the time for, for production of two proteins in, in eukaryotic cells. But there are no naturally occurring ones as far as we can tell. There are no naturally occurring eukaryotic polycystronic mRNAs where the iris is separating the open reading frames. I don't know why. We don't know. Now, this monocystronic restriction is a problem for viruses, because as you remember, many viruses, their genome is a single mRNA. So how can they make multiple proteins? So that is the conundrum we're going to address next. And that is how do you maximize the coding capacity of the viral genome so you can make more than one protein? You don't want to be limited by this monocystronic rule. So here are the different ways that viruses do it. And what, what, we, what I've listed here, the different mechanisms in what virus families do them. So they're poly, making a polyprotein is a good way to make many proteins from an, a single mRNA. We talked about some examples of that, the Bacorna and the Flaviviridae. Some viruses make subgenomic mRNAs. They make multiple mRNAs from a single template. So that's another way to make many proteins. You could have a segmented genome like influenza and rheoviruses. That allows you to make 8 or 10 or 12 minimum different proteins, one per segment. You could do internal initiation. So we just saw in the cricket paralysis virus genome how you can get two independent initiation uh, sites on a single mRNA with an iris. And then there are a number of mechanisms we haven't mentioned, and we'll go through these one by one. Leaky scanning, reinitiation of translation, suppression, and uh, ribosomal frame shifting. So let's just review polyprotein synthesis first. This, of course, is done by picornaviruses, shown at the top. The genome has a long open reading frame. It's translated into a long protein, and the protein is processed by two viral proteases to give all the final viral proteins. So you can see this is a very straightforward way to, to overcome the monocystronic restriction. You only have one mRNA in this virus, as far as we know. It doesn't make any subgenomic mRNAs, so it just makes a polyprotein. And a number of viruses do that. Uh, here's an example at the bottom of uh, a Flavy virus that does it. And again, you make a polyprotein and you process it, in this case, by both viral and uh, host proteases. Leaky scanning is another way of making many proteins from a single mRNA. And this is an example from the genome of a paramyxovirus. These are negative-stranded RNA viruses that make subgenomic mRNAs. So it makes a number of subgenomic mRNAs, and we're looking at one of them here. And this mRNA can encode multiple proteins, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven minimum different proteins. So how does it do that? This is a capped mRNA. Ribosomes bind the 5 prime end and they begin to scan. As they're scanning, they reach the first initiation triplet, which is an ACG at base 81. So this is not an AUG, but ribosomes sometimes will initiate at ACGs. They use the initiator metTRNA, which will weakly base pair with this, but still works. So you can get a little bit of translation initiation there. But most of the ribosomes don't initiate there, and they keep going. So you make a little bit of this C-prime protein. 
and most of the ribosomes continue to scan. They get to 104 where there is an AUG, and some of them initiate there and make a P protein, which is a different protein, different reading frame. But this is not a good sequence context, this AUG. The surrounding sequences of the AUG will influence translation initiation, and the sequences, and we call that the sequence context. And the context at this site isn't very good. So again, most of the ribosomes keep going. And then finally you reach 114, and this is a good AUG in a good context, so the remainder of the ribosomes initiate there. There are also two uh, downstream initiation sites at 183 and 201, and these are initiated by ribosome shunting. Remember the mechanism where ribosomes load on the 5' end, scan a bit, and then they leap over distances in, in here. They're leaping down to AUG 183 and 201, so two more proteins are made there. And just to show you how neat this mRNA is, there is another protein made by editing at this site. So this is a variant of uh, the P protein at this site. In some cases, uh, post-transcriptionally, bases are added to the mRNA. So when they are translated, it changes the reading frame. So here you get a different protein which terminates right there. So you would get the P protein, which... Uh, shifts to a different reading frame past the editing site, and then terminates. So this is one way that you can take it to the extreme. You can make a lot of proteins from a single mRNA, laughing in the face of the monosystronic rule, I like to say. Another mechanism for making multiple proteins from a single mRNA is reinitiation of translation. Now, I spent a bit of time telling you that eukaryotic ribosomes don't reinitiate very efficiently. Once they translate an open reading frame and reach a termination codon, they fall off, and they don't like to reinitiate at a downstream open reading frame. But under certain situations, you can get reinitiation of translation, and we've got two examples here in viral systems. At the top is a messenger RNA from a herpes virus, cytomegalovirus. This um, mRNA has a main open reading frame. It's in blue here. It's called the downstream ORF. But there are in the 5' non-coding region of these mRNAs, small open reading frames. They're called upstream ORFs. And they can be translated by ribosomes. The ribosomes, when finished translating, will keep scanning. They don't fall off, and they reach the downstream ORF. So they reinitiate translation. Another example below is an influenza virus mRNA, which has two open reading frames in it, the M1 and the BM2, and they overlap, as you can see. The ribosomes initiate at the 5' end. They translate the M1 ORF. They reach a termination codon, which is shown here, this UAA. But then they move one amino acid, excuse me, one base past that terminator and they find an AUG. Actually, the A of the AUG is the last base of the termination codon. So the ribosomes keep translating, but it's a separate protein. So they've reinitiated. They make the BM2 protein, which begins right there at that AUG. So two mechanisms of reinitiation. So because there are ways to reinitiate after termination, let's look a little bit at, at this termination process and see how this might work. Now, the way termination works on an mRNA, the ribosomes have been translating, uh, and they reach a termination codon, which is shown here as the amber codon. Remember, there's three kinds of terminators, amber, ochre, and umber, three different sequences. And these termination codons are recognized by specific termination proteins. They're called eukaryotic termination proteins, ERFs. And ERF1 uh, binds to the termination codon, it mimics a tRNA. It sits in there, has high affinity for the termination site. And what it does is dissociate the growing polypeptide chain and then cause eventually the ribosome to dissociate together with some other uh, termination proteins. Now, there are viral proteins and sequences that antagonize this dissociation. If you dissociate, you're never going to reinitiate. So there are viral ways to keep the subunits together. So, for example, there's a protein of HCMV, cytomegalovirus, and the reverse transcriptase of HIV actually uh, antagonize the um, dissociation of the 
two subunits and allow reinitiation to occur efficiently. Uh, influenza virus, the sequence we just looked at, allowing reinitiation. So let's go back. This little sequence right here promotes reinitiation so the ribosomes don't dissociate. And there's another such element. It's called an RNA cis element in the feline Calissi virus genome. So reinitiation of translation just doesn't occur randomly. It is stimulated by viral proteins or viral sequences. Another way to increase coding capacity is by suppression of termination. And here, let's go through the termination process again. We have a ribosome moving along mRNA. It's made a protein. You can see it here. The protein chain has grown. The protein is attached to the P site tRNA right here. And now we have a termination codon. This is recognized by ERF1 and 3. ERF1 mimics a tRNA and sits in the termination site, and ERF3 is associated with it. This causes release of the peptide chain and dissociation of the two subunits. However, occasionally, these stop codons are not recognized by this ERF1, but but by a tRNA that has an amino acid charged to it, and that's called suppression of termination. So just think that there's a tRNA in here instead of a termination protein, and then you can see that the translation will continue, and you keep making a protein. So you can imagine that some of the time you would get translation, you make one protein, and some of the time you would get suppression and make a longer protein. So here are two examples of viral genomes where that happens. On the left is a retrovirus genome. Uh, this is an mRNA actually made from a proviral DNA embedded in a host genome. It's made by transcription of the provirus. It encodes two precursor polyproteins, a GAG and the Paul protein. There is a stop codon between them. Here it is right here, UAG. Most of the time when ribosomes translate GAG, they terminate at this stop codon and fall off. But about 5 to 10% of the time, this stop codon is suppressed by a tRNA that has an amino acid attached to it. And therefore, you can get synthesis of a gag pol fusion protein. And this allows you to make, among other things, the reverse transcriptase, which is essential, of course, for replication of these viruses. Now, you don't need much of the RT. And so having an inefficient suppression lead to RT synthesis is not bad. It works. Just downstream of this terminator is a pseudonaut. Remember, a pseudonaut is a stem loop RNA structure where the loop is base pairing to a downstream sequence. And this is essential for suppression. If you mutate this pseudonaut so it doesn't exist, then you don't get suppression. And what's thought is to happen is that the pseudonaut impedes the movement of the ribosome. It briefly makes the ribosome pause and that may enhance suppression for some, for some mechanism that we don't understand. On the right is an example of a toga virus where the genome is a plus-stranded RNA. And when it, is, when it enters cells, it's initially translated. Ribosomes bind the cap. They translate this open reading frame. And then they reach a termination codon right there, that purple sequence. So they make this protein P123. About, again, 10, 5 to 10 percent of the time, you have suppression of this tRNA right here. So you can make a, a longer protein, P1234, and that allows you to make a RNA polymerase for the virus. So these four proteins constitute the RNA polymerase. So again, you don't need a lot of it, so the, the suppression you get, 5 to 10 percent, is enough to make uh, active levels of that protein. So that's two examples of suppression of termination. Now, when you get suppression, it typically can involve either a specific suppressor tRNA that recognizes termination codons, and, and they put in a very special amino acid, for example. In this case, selenocysteine is, is used to suppress UGA codons. So these are rather rare codons or tRNAs in cells, but they do exist. Or in some cases, normal tRNAs may misread termination codons and put in an amino acid. And that seems to be enhanced when you have secondary RNA structures in the area of the terminator that cause ribosome pausing. And finally, the last mechanism we'll consider for enhancing 
or enhancing the coding capacity of a viral mRNA is ribosomal frame shifting. And the, the example we'll use to illustrate it is, again, a retroviral genome, where, again, the mRNA has to encode two different precursor proteins, the structural gag precursor and the PAW precursor to all the enzymes that the virus needs, including the reverse transcriptase. You remember I showed you an example where these two proteins are separated by a, a stop codon. In this, in some retroviruses, the proteins are encoded in totally different open reading frames, overlapping open reading frames. So again, most of the time when this mRNA is translated, the ribosomes bind at the 5 prime N, they translate the gag protein, and then they reach a terminator here, and that's the end of it. So you get this protein gag, which is then processed to form the structural proteins. But again, at a low frequency, maybe 10% of the time, these ribosomes, upon reaching the end of the gag open reading frame, they actually back up one, one base. They shift into the minus one frame, and they continue to translate, in which case now they've gone into a different open reading frame. They bypass the terminator as a consequence. They don't see it as a terminator anymore. And they, they continue to translate the Paul open reading frame. So you get a gag Paul fusion. And that can be processed by proteases to liberate the RT, among other things. So again, you don't need a lot of these enzymes, because after all, they are enzymes. And, and frame shifting is enough to produce them. So let's see how this might work. This is a model for this minus one frame shifting, again, when the ribosome backs up one base. So you can see here the ribosome has two amino acyl tRNAs in the A and the P sites. They're base pairing very nicely with uh, the sequence on the mRNA. And here's the termination codon, which would cause the protein to end, and which does so most of the time. But in some cases, uh, the, the ribosome slips back one. And now you can see not bad base pairing on the slip back, right? There's this mismatched AA here and a mismatched UU, but there's enough to keep this stable. And then the ribosome begins to translate. Um, and you can see here now the next uh, triplet is no longer a terminator. So let's go from UAG. The, the next thing that was going to be recognized here would be the terminator. But now because the ribosome has gone back one, it's now recognizing AUA as the next triplet. So it puts in this isoleucine here instead of terminating. So now we're in the minus one reading frame. And we can keep translating. We go over this stop codon and we make a longer protein. It's a pretty neat way to, to overcome a stop codon, I think. All right, that brings us to a little section on how viruses regulate translation in virus-infected cells. <clears throat> now, there, there are a couple of goals here. The main one is viruses have evolved to shut off or regulate host translational systems so that they can have it to themselves. They don't want cellular mRNAs being translated. They want the ribosomes, the tRNAs, the amino acids, the whole translation apparatus to their own devices. Uh, so they, they regulate translation. Now the host in response, typically when infected by a virus, will shut down translation as a way of defending. It's kind of a host defense. So we're gonna talk about both mechanisms host shutoff and virus shutoff. Now, all the mechanisms of regulation that have been discovered in virus-infected cells are, sh are, are mainly tra target initiation, and those are the mechanisms in this table in, in blue with the blue line next to them. And I know you can't see these, but uh, these this table shows each uh, initiation or elongation or termination protein uh, the virus that's involved, and what the virus does to the target. So uh, we'll see later that EIF4G, for example, is cleaved in, in many virus-infected cells. So you, the point of this table is twofold. First, to show you how many different mechanisms there are by which viruses antagonize host translation. So clearly it's an important thing to take over. It's an important host cell process to take over. And secondly, you see most of the known processes affect initiation, but there are a couple for elongation and termination. So I want to look at just a few of these to illustrate them for you to see how some of them work. And the first involves EIF2, 
Now, you may remember that EIF2 is part of the ternary complex, and this is essential for translation initiation. In fact, when the 60S subunit joins the 40S at the AUG, uh, GTP, which is part of the ternary complex, is hydrolyzed to GDP. Now, the ternary complex, again, consists of the MET initiator tRNA, EIF2, and GTP. So now we have EIF2 after an initi a round of initiation. We have EIF2 bound to a molecule of GDP. And this is not useful for making a new ternary complex. You have to have GTP present. So it has to be recycled off. So that's done by a protein called EIF2P, which is a basically a GTP exchange factor. It binds GDP EIF2 and exchanges the GDP for a molecule of GTP. And then we now have EIF2 GTP, which can go combine with a MET tRNA and make a new ternary complex for initiation. This turns out to be a very crucial point of regulation of translation. The EIF2 subunit can be phosphorylated, as you can see here, and we'll talk about what does that in a moment. When EIF2 is phosphorylated, it will still bind EIF2B, the guanine exchange factor, but it binds so tightly that it cannot be released. So now what happens is all these phosphorylated EIF2 molecules soak up the EIF2B, which happens to be present in cells in low quantities. The amount of free EIF2B goes down, and eventually you cannot make EIF2 GTP, so you inhibit translation. So a very simple modification, phosphorylation of EIF2 inhibits translation. All right, so let's see how this works in a virus-infected cell. Cells contain three protein kinases that phosphorylate EIF2 alpha, a subunit of EIF2. When again, EIF2 is part of the ternary complex. They're called PKR, PERC, and GCN2. We're going to talk about PKR today. Uh, but I just want to point out that PERC is a, um, a, a kinase in the ER that responds to misfolded proteins, to stress. So under conditions of stress, which can happen in many ways, virus infection or low nutrients, uh, this, this uh, kinase phosphorylates EIF2 and shuts down translation because you don't want to make proteins under conditions of stress. And similarly, GCN2 is a kinase that responds to uh, nutrient levels. And when nutrient levels are low, phosphorylates EIF2. But we're going to look at PKR today, which is uh, a defense against virus infection. So when cells are infected by viruses, the, one of the early defenses is the interferon system. So here we have virus infecting a cell. It is sensed as foreign uh, by the virus, excuse me, by the cell in ways that we'll talk about later in another lecture, the cell responds by producing interferon, these purple triangles. The interferon is secreted from the cell and binds receptors on neighboring cells, and that induces the synthesis of mRNAs that encode many, many different proteins which establish an antiviral effect. Those are called interferon-stimulated gene products. One of these interferon-stimulated gene products is PKR, the kinase that phosphorylates EIF2-alpha. So this is an antiviral protein because it phosphorylates EIF2 and shuts down protein synthesis so the virus can no longer replicate. PKR then is induced by interferon as a consequence of virus infection. As it is made, it is inactive. PKR is shown here. It consists of a kinase domain and two double-stranded RNA binding domains. In order for it to be activated, it needs to be phosphorylated. And activation means that it's able to phosphorylate EIF2-alpha. The way PKR is activated is by phosphorylation, and the phosphorylator is a neighboring PKR molecule. So what happens is PKR binds double-stranded RNA. Uh, it does so via these double-stranded RNA binding motifs. And double-stranded RNA, of course, is made 
in many virus-infected cells, not only RNA viruses, but DNA viruses as well, by divergent transcription, say, from a double-stranded DNA genome. PKR molecules bind double-stranded RNA, and then neighboring PKRs bound to the same RNA phosphorylate each other. So they activate each other, and now these PKRs are able to go and phosphorylate EIF2-alpha. So PKR is induced, remember, by interferon. It's activated by virus infection. The activating mean PKR binds double-stranded RNA, phosphorylates itself, and then it can go on to inhibit protein synthesis. The phosphorylation of EIF2 inhibits host translation. It also stimulates apoptosis. And this is basically shutting down the cell so the virus can't replicate. It turns out that this is a very powerful means of repelling virus infection. And if viruses didn't antagonize it, they'd be wiped out. And almost every virus has some means of inactivating the PKR pathway. That's how important it is. So without an, an, a means of antagonizing PKR, viruses wouldn't survive. So let's take a look at a couple of mechanisms for doing this. So here is an example from adenovirus. Adenoviruses make double-stranded RNA during their replication, and this potentially could activate PKR by allowing uh, PKR molecules to bind to the RNA and, active and phosphorylate each other. The virus also makes a short double-stranded RNA called VARNA1. This does not encode any proteins. Rather, what it does, it is very short and therefore can only bind a single molecule of PKR. How clever is that? So now PKR binds it. It can't get phosphorylated because there's no other room for another PKR to bind. And so there's no shutoff of translation. So the virus has effectively... Uh, in, inactivated the PKR system. And that's just one way that viruses do it. There are many others. I just want to show you one more because this is also very neat. Uh, this is a an example from Vaccinia virus. This, pro, this virus encodes proteins that are pseudosubstrates. That is, they mimic EIF2-alpha. And they fool the kinase PKR into phosphorylating them instead of EIF2-alpha. So here's the three-dimensional structure of EIF2-alpha. And on the right are two vaccinia proteins that are clearly structural mimics of EIF2-alpha. And they are mimics of the part of EIF2-alpha that gets phosphorylated by PKR. Here's serine 51. That is where PKR puts a phosphate on to inactivate uh, the molecule. So these two proteins, K3L and M156R, they bind PKR, and they're made in big quantities in infected cells, and they basically sop up all the PKR so it can no longer go uh, to act on EIF2-alpha. So they're pseudosubstrates. And on this table, I've listed a number of different mechanisms that are uh, active in many virus-infected cells to antagonize this PKR system, essentially. You can see that a lot of different viruses are involved. Uh, a lot of viral proteins or RNAs are involved, and the targets are different. Some of them bind double-stranded RNA, some of them bind PKR, and some are pseudosubstrates. So again, this is a very important pathway, and vi many viruses have evolved mechanisms to get around it. All right, so Let's talk about how viruses modulate cell translation. We've talked about the cell's attempt, feeble attempt, I would say, to shut down translation to get rid of the virus infection. But as I've shown you, most viruses that, have, that are around today have gotten around that. Now let's look at how the virus regulates translation. And the goal here, of course, is to have the whole translational apparatus for themselves. And we're going to look at regulation of EIF4F, which again is a complex of EIF4G, EIF4E, and EIF4A, these three proteins here. And basically what's, what we're going to look at is cleavage of EIF4G, so it's really one of the subunits of EIF4F. And this is done by viral proteinases, 2A or L, 
Now, this is done by viruses that have an iris. They don't have caps, so they don't need intact EIF4G. So let's see how this works. Here's an example in cells infected by polio virus. If you monitor the rate of protein synthesis at different hours post-infection, in polio-infected cells, you can see the rate of synthesis declines very quickly by two hours, and then it's replaced by a new round of translation, which is viral protein synthesis. What happens here is that the host cell translation is shut off. You can see this on the gel to the right. This is a protein gel showing labeled proteins at different times post-infection with polio. You can see at zero times there's a big schmear of cellular proteins that are made. And by three hours, you can see that is starting to decrease in intensity as the virus shuts off translation. And then by five hours, you have mainly viral proteins made. So this makes perfect sense to humans anyway that you'd want to shut off the host to get all of the apparatus to yourself. So how does this work? Two virus proteases, either 2A in polio or the L protease in other viruses, cleaves EIF4G near its end terminus. And as you can see, that takes away the EIF4E binding site on EIF4G. So capped messages can no longer be translated because you can't get the ribosome to bind, right? If you cleave 4G here, even if 4E could bind the capped message, it couldn't recruit the ribosome because all the 4G in the cell is now cleaved and it no longer has a 4G binding site. So that effectively shuts down cap-dependent translation. But it's brilliant, of course, because these viruses that do this have an iris in their genome. They're not capped, so they don't need this this 5' prime EIF4E, or I should say N-terminal EIF4E binding site. It's very neat. Now, a consequence, there are serious consequences of translational inhibition that go beyond what we have talked about so far. So let's say we have um, a cell which is making proteins. Uh, it gets infected by a virus. Now, so here's our circular uh, polysome. It's got ribosomes translating a circular mRNA. A virus infects the cell. Uh, the cell responds by phosphorylating EIF2, or the virus cleaves, say, 4G, and this inhibits translation. So now we have what we call stalled translation initiation complex because these mechanisms of initiation mainly act at the level of uh, initiation. These are, are sensed by the cell. The cell says, aha, uh -huh, we have stalled translation complexes. And what it wants to do is sequester them into what are called stress granules. And it does so by making a number of proteins or having a number of proteins that are shown here in yellow. And these form structural components of the stress granule. So these are actually very discrete areas of the cytoplasm. They're quite small. You can see them in a the light microscope, though that contain these proteins and stalled translation complexes. And the cell's idea is that we're going to protect these RNAs until the virus is over or some other time. Now, of course, the virus does not want to be have its mRNAs put into these stress granules because these are basically silenced areas where no translation happens. So many viruses encode antagonists of stress granules. You can see all these viruses listed here antagonize stress granule formation. And for some of them, we know which proteins are antagonized specifically. So, for example, polio cleaves this particular component, G3BP, of the stress granule to prevent their formation. So you ha viruses have evolved to antagonize stress granule formation. Now, when translation is inhibited in a cell, there's actually another pathway that the stalled complexes can take, so it can either go to stress granule formation. There are also another set of bodies in the cell called P bodies, which are similar. They contain stalled translation complexes, and again, viruses don't want to be put into them, so they antagonize their assembly as well. This pathway is accompanied by destruction, of, or can be accompanied by destruction of the mRNAs. So there are a variety of cell proteins shown in blue here that uh, decap the RNA, take off the poly A, and even degrade it. And this can happen outside or within the P-body. And again, these P-bodies are bad for viral mRNAs, so viral proteins have evolved to antagonize uh, their formation.
The last subject I want to discuss with you with respect to translation has to do with microRNAs. And as you may know, these are small non-coding RNAs that are found encoded in cellular or viral genomes. They're made by PAL2 this, or PAL3, the, and they're made as precursors, which are then processed to 21 nucleotide microRNAs. And our genome encodes over a 1,000 of these microRNAs, and they have important roles in regulating protein synthesis. And the way they work is to they bind the three-prime untranslated region of messenger RNAs, and they either cause degradation of the mRNA or they repress translation. And this is where we want to talk a bit about this right now. These microRNAs function in a protein complex called the microRNP, and this, in addition to the microRNA, has a, a number of cellular proteins, one of them called dicer, which you may imagine can dice up the RNA to which the uh, microRNA is pointing. And these microRNAs typically are complementary to the three-prime untranslated region of the mRNA. And so here we have at the bottom the three-prime UTR of a mRNA, the end of the open reading frame. We have a poly-A tail. And here's a typical binding site for a microRNA. It hybridizes in two regions with a bulge in between. It's quite close to the three-prime end. And again, the amount of complementarity determines whether the mRNA is degraded or translation uh, is repressed. Uh, the higher complementarity leads to degradation, the lesser leads to repression of translation. And we think that these affect translation in two ways. The mechanisms are still being worked out, but here we have an mRNA with these microRNPs bound to the three prime end. Remember, the microRNAs plus a couple of cell proteins. Uh, it's been found that the microRNPs bound to the three prime UTR can affect initiation. They can block cap recognition or even 60S subunit joining. Again, mechanisms to be determined. And they can also block elongation. So, depending on the particular microRNA, can it have an effect uh, by causing ribosomes to slow down, for example, or even fall off. So that's how they regulate uh, translation. I want to leave you with a couple of interesting examples of microRNAs and how they interfere or participate in viral replication. There's an interesting one in the liver called MIR-122. It's liver-specific, and it's absolutely required for hepatitis C virus replication. If you take it away, the virus can't replicate. And this is in part why the virus is hepatotropic. And right now, drugs are being developed to target this microRNA because it would be a good antiviral therapy. A number of microRNAs in the cell target either viral or cellular genes that are needed for viral replication. And these have been identified in various systems. Um, you might be wondering what cellular genes would be needed for viral replication. Well, viruses, of course, have evolved to use different cellular genes in different stages of their replication cycles. And so there are microRNAs within us that regulate those genes and mod modulate virus infection. Now, on the other hand, viruses have evolved to take advantage of some of these mirrors. For example, MIR-141 targets the mRNA encoding EIF4E. So this is a mirror that exists in the cellular genome probably to regulate EIF4E production. When enteroviruses infect cells, they induce the production of MIR-141. And what does that do? That decreases the amount of EIF4E, and of course 4E is the cap-binding protein. So it shuts down cap-dependent, 5 prime end dependent protein synthesis, which of course the enteroviruses don't care about because they have an iris and they don't need caps. This is brilliant. This is just brilliant. They take advantage of something that's already there and use it for their own good. Diabolical. Do viral genomes encode microRNAs? Some of them do. Herpes viruses have a lot of them, a fewer in other viruses. Um, and what they do is still being worked on. This is a very active area of investigation. We know already that uh, 
Many of these block apoptosis. When viruses infect cells, the cells respond by killing themselves. Uh, and viruses want to block that because they want to replicate. And some of these viral mirrors block apoptosis. They help the virus escape from immune responses. Here's an interesting one. Some of them prevent the arrest of the cell cycle. Upon infection, many cells stop dividing in response to infection. Another antiviral response. Viruses, especially DNA viruses, want the cells to be dividing because they need the DNA replication machinery. So they have mirrors to make the cells keep dividing. Amazing. And some of the mirrors promote latency. That is, the ability of the virus to remain in the cell for a long period of time. And presumably you'll hear more of that from Dr. Silverstein in a later lecture. So we have now taken these mRNAs, these central mRNAs. We've made proteins. Next time we're going to use those proteins to make particles. We're going to assemble virus particles, and that will complete our analysis of the viral replication cycle.